So my name is Catherine Nakalembe. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Geographical Sciences at the University of Maryland and I'm the Africa Program Director for NASA Harvest, which is NASA's Agriculture and Food Security uh, Initiative and uh, the Agriculture and Food Security thematic lead for a NASA program called SEVERE, which is an applied sciences program that intends to increase capacity on the utilization of Earth, of Earth observations globally. This is a really uh, cool question. I always think about the astronauts standing in the maze field, but um, to kind of put it in the most simple way, uh, the first Earth observing satellites, basically satellites that are in space collecting data on Earth, mm -hmm. um, started in the 70s and what this opens up is the fact that we can look at all places on the earth consistently with the same kind of eyes if you think about it that way, right? So in terms of uh, the vantage point of space, we're able, we're able to have a, a broad view of everywhere. So if you think about a photograph taken of the entire earth every single day continuously, right? Yeah. So that's kind of the space component, right? And then um, in terms of agriculture, if you think about land use and land cover change, Fundamentally, what we do on Earth, uh, if we observe it from space, we can see it both in time as it changes and in space as it evolves you know, more broadly. So I can look at, um, we can develop models and methods to distinguish between different crop types. So maize in the context, of, say, of Germany is different from maize in the context of Kenya. So we build models to distinguish or to model these different crops using the same data set. So I can look at Europe with Sentinel-2 data, I can look at Kenya with Sentinel-2 data, and then I can try to model and predict uh, what the outcome will be for growing season based off of what we've learned in the past. And so the vantage point of space is that um, taking pictures continuously over time, over the same places globally, allows us to be able to model these things. And then on the other side is that now, it is impossible to do it physically everywhere. So if I was tasked to understand agricultural productivity in Germany as an individual and I'd have to physically go and, you know, check uh, what crops are growing where, how they're growing, would be basically impossible. And so we try to build models to leverage the fact that we have photographs of all over the world that allow us to um, extract information that tells us how things are doing. This is a really good, uh, a really good question, and something that I've basically thought about a lot. So we worked on a paper called AI EO, uh, Artificial Intelligence, Earth Observations for Agriculture, and we were thinking about considerations like what things do you consider in the process of you generating information and knowledge, like if you're working in a context of Africa. So from my experience, at least from what I learned, is that. The knowledge about what's happening on the landscape as an outsider uh, is not the same as when I work with a, a, a local partner or when I work with a local farmer. So in my presentation, you might have seen the, my last slide with this uh, woman in Jombe, in Tanzania, pointing out something on the computer. Yeah. To me, this is like one of those revelations. Uh, not that I didn't know that somebody, for example, from Berlin knows a lot more about Berlin than I will ever but that this farmer, for the first time looking at a satellite image, was able to tell us if you go to this farm, this farm, this farm, there's maize there, maize there, not maize here, right? Just purely from that experience. And that knowledge and that revelation has sort of been part of my work. So when I do really cool projects, which only come to life because I've considered, I've considered working um, in, in local context for different countries. I'm going to give you an example that kind of highlights like mm -hmm. how youth can be critical and important and can generate really cool ideas. So we have this project, as I explained before, we need data to train models. So we need to collect data. We yeah. need examples of what maze looks like. So you have to physically go to a field, take a GPS point, and then later on we'll be used to train a, a model to extract information that we can apply you know, to much larger places. So this is a very complicated problem in the sense that not only does it cost so much money, it needs people to be physically present in different places, right? So how do you change how it's done? So do I go myself and my team physically everywhere? Yeah. Um, that will reduce the geographic scope. It would take so much time. Crops have a timestamp. They cannot be in the field for as long as you want to. And so how 
we did this project, we call it helmets labeling crops, is basically we worked with local motor drivers, like uh, border motor drivers, as, as they call them in, in, in Uganda, for example. Um, we had GoPro cameras, uh, which are the primary tool that we're using to collect data. And how we innovated in this is basically the GoPro camera is installed in the helmet of the motor driver who drives. And as they drive, they take pictures, right? And later on, we have a much more complicated process of extracting the crop type from those pictures. But in the process of discussing what the problem was with two motor drivers, we came up with the solution of, so we'd come up with these fancy things as we were planning. We will make sure we have so many batteries, we will make sure we have uh, extra memory cards, we make sure we have the hard drives. It is insane to carry all that, that equipment in the field, right? And the solution was, um, one of them had a charging port on the motorbike. And he said, but what if I could just plug it in here so I don't have to change the battery? This literally changed everything and it changed the whole process in the sense that we're thinking, okay, we need a much better device. We need a much higher storage on the actual camera, no hard drives, no extra things that we would maybe forever, maybe consider to use in the past. And so the only way this came about and the only way we've been able to be successful in this project is by working with young, very innovative uh, individuals that you just like run into who are doing research at an ag research station or who happen to be within the vicinity. And in that process, we've collected over 5 million images in over six countries. Uh, but now we're drowning in data. We have the opposite problem. But we managed to get data in uh, Nigeria, which was not one of the core countries initially. Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda. If you think about, um, we even have data from the US, from France. And um, the problem is very simple once you explain it. It's very, very easy for a youth you know, to be like, I get it, I'm going to do it. Sorry, no I'm just getting you all over my brain. I apologize. <laughs> and so, um, going back to the you know equitable, uh, the, you know the equitable part of um, how do you how do you work, how do you work equitably um, with the youth? So it's very easy for me to design this project and put it on somebody and be like, all right, you're gonna drive your bike a hundred miles every day and do some random stuff for me. When I'm done, I will publish my paper. I'll be very happy mm -hmm. and you'll never see me again. So um, this is very easy. This is probably maybe 50% or more, 80% of our research is done. Um, so how do you change that? One is that we have a relationship. So while we're solving the problem, um, anybody, we communicate and try to figure out how to do it. The second part is um, when we asked, uh, when we're trying to figure out how to test it, I asked um, a motor driver to suggest somebody else who they trust who could do it really well. So obviously there's so many, right? And then we asked, how much do you, how much would you like to be paid to do this the whole day? And they were like, hmm, maybe 150. And we're like, okay, so that sounds good, but we'll double it. Because we understand the actual cost and the actual burden. And the con you know, the things that I don't think about, for example, is uh, what's gonna happen to their bike after you drive five, hundred kilometers for example and then on the other side is um, accepting and uh, acknowledging the knowledge and information that they're providing so in terms of routes and things it's very easy for me to say I really want this point you need to go to it but it's not physically possible um, and so accepting it within my design of the work that I do that there are all these consequences and complexities and so um, we say this is a task do it and in the process actually two of the teams were able to do twice as much work with the same amount of money as others and this was acceptable to us because we understand that in one geography while it might be cheap and easy to do it might not be in another and so um, like we have a forum or discussion an open way of sharing information I think the other part of it is um, mentoring and working with people who were motivated. So the best part is, at least from, from my perspective, from my work is when people are excited to see me, this is like really fantastic. It means that I bring good memories. Um, and the other part is um, when they reach out to me and say, you know, after I met you, I've considered a career in this field and how do I go about it? 
Oh, a few years later, I finished my master's degree and I'm starting my new job. And so um, opening up avenues for them to see that there is room uh, if they prepare. And if they're prepared and the opportunity arrives, then you know, you're able to elevate them to that level. So there's that, there's that other component, which is they might not have the knowledge you expect of them for the task that you have at hand, but you can show them the way that later on, you know, three years later, they're able to contribute really positively to what you do. So I always have the people that I, the person that, one of the people that I worked with when I was doing my PhD, we text almost every day, uh, for example. And if there is, my, the focus of my research was around drought and agriculture. And if there is a drought event, I will get a text message. I'll get an update of what's happening. And then from that, we can look more deeper at the problem and then maybe write an article that, you know, highlights this, this particular uh, this particular problem. The other side, oh my God, it's such a long answer, is uh, <laughs> elevating um, other people. So when we do work in Kenya, it's very easy for me to be like, yeah, you know, I did all of this. It's so really fantastic and uh, speak about it. But they're like wonderful, amazing people who make so many things come to life. And um, I don't want to name names, but like a lady that I work with, particularly in Kenya, her name is Jane. Uh, being able to have her voice in the work that we do, uh, including highlighting her to be, you know, profiled and communicate or presenting the work that has been useful for her own work herself at international meetings is really critical. And so finding those avenues that elevate people, that you know, their contribution is really appreciated is another component. So that they're not just like the data collector or the guy, that they actually have voices as part of the process of generating really fancy, very complicated uh, knowledge. Yeah. So, long answer. Long answer, but a very, a good, amazing answer. Yeah, a lot of different answers. <laughs> I mean, the theme of uh, there's a complexity. Yeah. Right? Everything is really complex, and so how do you value? I think um, how do you value knowledge? What is knowledge, right? Somebody telling you the shortcut to a pond is value. It's so much value. Imagine hiking over a mountain when you could just go around the corner, and you at the point, right? So that's like being and knowing and accepting that this person knows better than me in this particular context is really important. Yeah. Um, I would say that uh, quite challenging. Um, I think at the beginning, I just wanted to do, do and do um, and learn and learn and acquire. In my personal statement applying for my master's, I was like, I want to acquire all the knowledge and apply it back. So I set a very small goal, which is like impact my life, uh, like change someone's life for with my knowledge, that's kind of like what I set for myself. Um, but in the process, I learned um, so many other things that I didn't think I would learn in the journey. And I think the biggest, most powerful asset that I have is preparation, um, as well as um, trying to survive in an ever-evolving field requires a lot of reading, a lot of preparation, but also respect um, and being open to other people's ideas and knowledge and working as a, as a team. And so as a woman, um, I've worked in a very strong women-led group. Um, so for example, the director of our program is a woman and we had kids around the same time. So this, you know, played, a, it was a very positive uh, space in terms of I can be a mother, uh, but I can also continue on my path and when I need the space for example when I had my sons it was a nightmare uh, in many ways because I didn't sleep for like six months but I had the room um, that others gave me and the opportunity to step back into the work when I was ready but having my sons too motivated me to be I don't know, I think I changed completely, or maybe I didn't change completely, but it's like I had a whole other purpose for why I had to do it, because I want my sons to know that they're strong women who work and can also be great mothers. And it's, it's, it's very complicated and complex. And I think the other side of it obviously is having people that believe in you and who mentor you, sponsor you, who open up the doors. Otherwise, you know, I wouldn't be able to have the platform that I have and so um, 
through international connections and communications or research that I've done, the people who, you know, I get an email that says Catherine is uh, a good speaker, you should invite her. And then, you know, it turns out that I don't know anything about the meeting or uh, it might not be the right uh, platform for the work that I do. But then I'm open and I hear what they're asking and then I prepare for what they're asking for. But in that instance, usually I find that there are other people interested in my work. So I think being open-minded, having people that you can trust that you can always bounce ideas off of and having a very supportive uh, work set up is really critical because when you become a mother it's like a whole animal game. It changes everything. There's so many considerations and so many things and I'd say that the people that I work with or the community that I work with they didn't see this as a weakness, um, even though I thought that that's what it was going to be the case because I didn't keep it the secret forever. <laughs> um, but when I was ready to step back in, um, the room, you know, there was room for me to be a part of uh, the process and do the work the way I think it should be done. So that that is another another part of it, like being able to. After you gain the knowledge, remembering your true self that when you do it, you do it the way um, that, that you see best. You know, there are so many methods that have been designed by invincible people. I can't be invincible, I'm vulnerable. So that is a part of uh, being my true self in that sense. So being a mother can, uh, if you see you see me with my sons, you'll be like, I do not know this person. But it's just I'm myself uh, in, in every moment, even though it's a different self, but it's just who I am. One example um, is, there's this program, which I guess was the most impactful thing that I worked on. It was purely by chance, it was my PhD, my PhD topic where I was focused on, and then they were starting a World Bank project that could fund something, not my work, but fund a program that could support people who are impacted by drought, which is my main, my main subject. And I was trying to use data to point out how bad droughts can be, how early they can be. And in this process, even though I thought that I was the most knowledgeable person about the particular area, there's like geographic area, so that's one aspect. Two, subject matter, because it was like, agriculture, land use, drought. This is literally my PhD thesis. Um, and I was trying to make the case that I know how the data technical component of this would work, but it's almost like I had to be like, you know I know, you know I do A, B, C, D, you know I work with A, B, C, D to justify that I can direct or I can determine how something should be executed. And this did not work actually. Um, but you know what worked? The person who was in charge um, said, we will do what Catherine says. And I will never forget this moment because if I could, uh, um, if I could explode, because I you know, turned turn my face to look you know, around the room, because this was such a powerful statement. I was just a PhD student. I'd just written my first chapter of my PhD. I was working on the second one. And um, this made it possible for me to literally focus my PhD part, the third part, on how to enable this program work and how it could work long term. And so the fact that he said we would do what Catherine says, you know, gave a clear message to everybody in the room. You might have your doubts, but we're gonna do what she says, and that's like really, really powerful. So like that's one of those things that I that I remember. I don't know in this case if this person is a mentor or a sponsor, but is a believer, right? And this put this huge task on me, but I knew if I couldn't do it, there was nobody else who could do it because this was my research. So it's sort of like I prepared, I'm ready, and the door was like open wide, and I was ready to walk in in that sense. So that's kind of like you know, another example. Yeah. Don't discount your knowledge. Don't yeah. discount your contribution. Um, you never know. Um, and it's always important to know. So, um, so I'm going to kind of shift gears a little bit, but uh, to give you another example is this, you know, belief, which I don't know where it comes from, uh, zombie statistics or something like that, that, and that I think one of the questions was around, uh, one of the responses was like, you know, AI is not going to fix our problems, right? I had a graphic which I did not put in my presentation. It was something like, 
click here to save the world. <laughs> you know, you're like, I think, I don't know why I did not put it in there. Uh, that was supposed to be the right, was that, is that, did I have it? It's like, click, yeah, click here to save the world, right? Um, and um, I find myself in instances where, you know, it's like this big meeting, a high level event. And a lot of people believe that the data models that we're building will actually save the world, right? But the pathway from a data product to a life-changing event or scenario is so far away. It is so, so, it is so, the gap is so wide. And so while people are like, well, I could tell you what's happening in place X and tell you the extent and the impact of this particular thing, it is almost 90% never true. Um, and so it is my responsibility as part of my my knowledge to you know point out that okay so while I can tell you how vegetation is generally doing in Western Kenya I can't tell you specifically that Fama X's crop is in this particular state uh, because I cannot tell you unless I'm physically there right and so communicating the shortcomings of your work which is completely outside of you it's just like it's just pure fact that uh, the pixel level, which is the smallest area that we can disaggregate on the ground with the satellite data set, um, even if I have that value, it doesn't tell me about what the outcome is for the person who manages that particular field because I don't know the context, I don't know the situation that they have. While they might produce a lot, it might be um, they might not have access to a market. So their increased productivity does not equal increased food security, right? So communicating that also, I cannot really know specifically the condition of someone's particular field is, it's just, it's just pure fact. And so I can't say, and sometimes we call them, we call it a satellite evangelist, like evangelism to convince people that we can see everything and snap our fingers and tell you everything. It is, it is it's a very long process. Just like when there's a flood, determining how many buildings were damaged, there's a whole bunch of processing that has to happen. But even when you get an estimate, it doesn't tell you the level of severity. You do not know what was in the building. Um, you do not know if there were people in the building. Uh, you do not know uh, what on the on, gr on the ground situation is specifically. So there are those gaps. And it's important to communicate that while I know this, I can't tell you this for certain. And I think there's a other dimension about communicating uncertainty, which is one of the limitations between science and policy. When you tell somebody the model performs this way, plus or minus something, they're like, what do you mean? I just want to know, is it going to flood? Is it going to rain? It's like, well, you know, I'm 90% certain it will rain and uh, um, if this could lead to Floods, and then it doesn't, right? So there's like that other complexity of communicating uncertainty, which is does not align with policymakers. They're like, I just want to know the exact number. So if you're off by a hundred thousand, you do. Nobody will read your research again. I don't know. So. Right.